Well, I want to welcome everyone to our Two Posh Podcast. I am Gabrielle, and I'm here with my co-host, Marcella, my beautiful daughter. Hello. And Spider, our DJ and technician. Hello. Hello. And our special guest today, I am so honored that you're here, Dr. Greg Jamalis. Good morning. From Capel, <laughs> Texas. He is an optometrist. I have a hard time saying that word. And the founder and owner of LaserFit Scleral Contact Lenses. Perfect. Um, and you... Your office is in Carpel, Texas. Absolutely. And um, we, you have been our eye doctor for close to 30 years. Our family eye doctor, that's insane. I feel so privileged, <laughs> really. <laughs> now, you have to know that, I'm. you know this anyways, we don't go to the doctor a whole lot. I don't, um, I'm more like, okay, when there's a problem, but I try to come for a checkup every once in a while, <laughs> you know. We, we might be more alike than you think. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, but you have been a one and only eye doctor since I came to this country. So uh, my whole family, my children, everyone has always come to you because I believe mm. you are an amazing eye doctor. So anyone. I don't think I go as much as I should. Are you supposed to get an eye checkup, like a doctor checkup? Like once a year, right? Oh. That's like, know that. you should. At least four times a year. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that. <laughs> that means I'm way overdue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but in this first show, I wanted to actually introduce you to the world and like get to know you better and what you're all about because you are actually a very, like you're such a humble human being, yet you have some amazing like stories. Just wait for the second show. What he does is unbelievable. But also, um, I know that I want to get like back a little bit, like just very short. Give us a little synopsis: how you grew up, where you grew up, how you got into what you do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let me finish blushing first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I grew up in the Midwest in a small farming community, and the name of that community was uh, is Pena, Illinois. It's right in the center of Illinois, and a uh, population of about 6,500. Small Ooh. town. No you have a lot of yeah. small town yeah. people that come in here. That's so interesting. <laughs> and so it was an idyllic uh, childhood, really. That town had uh, a nice city park. It had a hospital, a swimming pool. In the summertime, my mom would buy me a season ticket to the swimming pool, and I'd <laughs> I'd spend all day there. You, you know? had yeah. a season ticket? Well, only we could only swim in the warm weather. You know, it gets oh, kind of yeah, cold. Yeah, then. yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so, you know, just a normal childhood, really. I got interested in uh, in music when I was in high school. I did play some basketball and, and you know the typical sports that you do when you're growing up, and um, yeah was a member of a rock band for a little while. No, oh, yes. right. musician. <laughs> did you what what did you do in the rock band? I played the lead guitar. Huh? Do so you still play guitar? But I didn't sing. I couldn't okay. sing. <laughs> <laughs> you could just play the guitar. Yes. That's pretty impressive. I wish I could play guitar. And so some of our members uh went on to become quite quite famous actually, but uh who who what the it, did? we were just one hit wonders or how it's probably more correct to say, no hit wonders. <laughs> <laughs> we were just a cover band and uh, went to Nashville and recorded a couple times. Uh, that's cool. That's, that's impressive, that's though. Just a little bit. I mean, yeah. that's a major musician to do that. How long did you do that? A mm, couple years. A couple years? All. Yeah, I went to college and changed my major to chemistry, and everybody else was music, so I, I was the odd man out. <laughs> <laughs> do you still play guitar sometimes? Um, not too often anymore. You but know. could you? I could. Sure. Yeah. I have several. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. That's impressive. I wish I could play guitar. I know. Jolie wants you, to. My nails are too long. I'm sure you could learn. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have Jolie teach me, I think. <laughs> Our little sister. one, um, she is all into music suddenly and wanted nothing else but a guitar for her birthday. So now she's trying to learn that. Oh, how neat. You, yeah. need, you need to take her in the spring to the Dallas Guitar Show, the International Guitar Show. I go there every year really? just to look at the new, you know, look the at all the uh, vintage stuff, mm -hmm. and new stuff. And, new uh, stuff. They have some amazing acts there, guitar players, you know. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Wow. We'll have to go. I know. So yeah, it's right down the street. Who got, who got famous from your band? 
Oh, um, well, one of our members became a record producer, so he produced a lot of really country hits. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I know. Wow, that's amazing. I, so, were you an only child? You have siblings. Um, no, I have a sister, a younger sister. sister. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are you close to her? Yes, yes, we're pretty close. Yeah, we try to get together at least once every couple of years. She's <laughs> living in Connecticut. Oh, wow. okay. Um, so the musician, how do you get then from musician? How did you decide to become an eye doctor? Well, of course, you know, that was not a serious career, right? That would not be a career. <laughs> being uh, an eye doctor? No. No. Being a musician. Oh, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> My, that was a myself moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, we got to find something respectable to do, and uh, so I got interested in uh, chemistry. And so I got out of college, I got tired of uh, being, you know, in the classroom all the time. So I went to work. I wanted to get out and uh, um, see what the world was like. So I, I worked for a pharmaceutical company for a few years, and then. Uh, another medically related company for a few years, and that's when I decided the corporate life was really not for me. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to school to uh, do what I'm doing now. And it's been been very gratifying. I'm glad I found this career. Right. Wow. That's amazing. How long do you have to go to school for that? Optometry is a four-year program. It's very similar to dentistry. So it's kind of a standalone profession and... Uh, after undergrad, it's a four-year professional program. So very, very much like um, medical school, but and more, more oriented, of course, to the eye. Yeah. So when you are done with school, then how, how does your career like? What does one go next? Do you go work in an office? Do you? How do you open? <laughs> because you have your own building and everything. So is that what you do right out of co of college or? Well, very various scenarios there. Um, in my case. Um, the first thing I did was get out of Illinois, where it was cold yeah, all the say, time. What brought you yeah. to Dallas? Uh, just uh, wanted to get into a warmer, sunnier place. And it, at that time, there were a lot of people moving to Dallas, just okay. like now. I mean, yeah. it's very similar now to what it was 30 plus years ago when I moved here. And uh, so I, I managed to land a job in, a, in an office working for a couple other doctors and I quickly found Capel. It was a, really? uh, an up and coming community, very small, but they seemed to have a really good uh, group of people there who were very pro growth mm -hmm. and, you know, were promoting the city mm -hmm. very, very much. So it drew me out there and I <clears throat> drove out there the first time and I I don't know if you recall how Capel was many years ago. I, so I totally do. Like, Country. Yeah, there was like, you know, asphalt roads yeah. and there was like a Dairy Queen on one corner. I don't and know this. Mm -hmm. A gas station on the other. And I arrived at that stop sign and I looked around. And I said, well, this can't be. <laughs> this can't be Compel. So it wasn't until several months later I drove out again and instead of turning left, I turned right. And then I saw all the, the housing mm -hmm. and, and the developments <laughs> there. So, um, you know, there was no office space then. Uh, there was an office building, and a, you know, a gentleman by the name of Ron uh, owned that building, and he said, well, I'm looking to add on to the building, and you give me a good uh, opportunity to do that. So uh, I leased my first 1,500 square feet in Capel, and uh, the rest is history, I guess. Wow. So I grew up with the community. Um you're the founder of the Capel Chamber of Commerce, too. You're one this, of the founders, this is correct? True. This is true. I, that that was recently hung around my neck. There were several of us. Huge deal. Yeah. All, all of the uh, most of the businesses were just located in a couple of office buildings, and so we we could network. And there was an upswell of support for a chamber of commerce because uh, doing business at that time was not easy. You know, getting known and yeah. And uh, getting people to do business in, in Capel. And so we got together and uh, there was an attorney in our office building. And so we took our charter papers down there. I signed and somebody else signed. And years later now, the Chamber of Commerce has moved into its own facility, freestanding facility in Capel. And at the ribbon coming, coming uh, cutting, they decided to uh, honor 
the legacy members of which I was you, one. Yeah. And what happened was that uh, someone stepped forward and gave a history of the chamber and after describing, you know, Capel and, and the various people involved, the players, he turned around to me and said, Greg Jamola started the chamber. <laughs> and I, I was totally shocked. So <laughs> well, uh, it true. was a group effort, uh, but my name was on the charter. Did, um, how many members are there now? About. Like, it has a lot, I know. Well, that, that was the one question I was not prepared to answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's we just, had, no, it we had over a 100 members our first year, and we hired our first chamber executive mm -hmm. that first year. So it was self-sustaining the we first year. We were part of the chamber a couple of times with the Dane Studio, Studio yeah. actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember one time the uh, chamber executive director, uh, I was at the time was in the process of building my office building, and we had the, the bricks uh, in the parking lot in pallets and uh, the color of the brick was kind of a light beige as it is now mm -hmm. and uh, it was rumored that you could not have anything other than a red brick wow. structure in Compel and mine was the first not to not be that color red. you know you know the the city hall and yeah. all those buildings so there's a uniformity they wanted uh, and uh, I, I kind of broke the mold. <laughs> you broke the rules. <laughs> and one day, I, one day I get a call from the chamber director, and he said, uh, Dr. G, he says, um, are those your bricks that are going on your building? I said, yes. He said, my bar one, I want to take it to a <laughs> city council meeting. And, uh, Jimmy Johnson wants to open a Miami Subs in Capel, <laughs> and because of the color, they don't want to approve it. Oh, what? So I I can't tell you if he actually <laughs> there is no Miami subs. No, <laughs> so because we didn't get approved. Wow. But I think I get away with it because the color of my building is earth tone. Right. It's, it has an earth tone to it, and it's not just a whitewash. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a it's a nice building, and you did something amazing. Really, I mean, he has his own all the store with all the yeah. glasses and everything. It's incredible. Um, now I know that you. Did you study in Austria? I did. I was a whole whole year. My entire senior college year you was spent there. In and, Vienna, right? In Vienna. Did you like it? Love it. It's my favorite city, it's really, a, outside of Dallas, you yeah. know, outside of Capel. Dr. Jamalis goes and spends a lot of time in Austria. Sometimes I think he spends more time there than me. <laughs> which <laughs> my mom's very homesick and right very now, homesick. especially. And um, he just recently went there and he has what's so cool i want him to tell us more about it when he travels overseas he always does um he makes sure that he meets a celebrity chef and has a meal with a celebrity chef so he went to austria and found this amazing place that i've never heard of but uh -huh. people arrive there with helicopters usually what? but he did not do that but oh. he went with a limo and you go there and then they gave him like his own what would you say? Is it? How would you describe where you stayed? You thought you were going to get one room, but they gave you like the whole house, right? Tell us more about this place. <clears throat> okay, so um, <clears throat> we spent, we usually spend two weeks and uh, we like to concentrate in particular area. We don't like to, you know, cover too much. And Austria is a place we keep going back to because we know it enough that we can jump off and find something else, you know. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to explore a little bit more of the countryside. And there is a family uh, from Vienna called the Reitbauer family, and, and they started in the 1970s the first gourmet or French-style restaurant, you know, upper end with the white tablecloths and mm -hmm. everything in Vienna. And so they got quite a following. And... Uh, they the, the the founders the parents uh, have moved into to uh, a place in Styria and they have opened up a roadhouse there and uh, <clears throat> it's become very very famous and uh, I mean there's there's a, a waiting list to get there and they also have accommodations I think that's the thing to do now if you're a celebrity chef you know you offer rooms where people can stay okay. After they've eaten and drank and what have you. Can you can so pass out over here. 
And so one one of the when we arrived there, uh, it was uh, quite a busy place. It was in the afternoon. There were uh, people uh, filming inside, filming a commercial, and um, an an older lady came up to us, and and she uh, had the keys to our room. And on the keychain was a picture of this house, this uh, typical Austrian style mountain hut. Mm-hmm. And uh, she said, this is your key where you're going to be staying. And, and then she left, and I sat there with my wife, and I thought, hmm, I wonder, I wonder what floor we're on. You know? <laughs> and yeah. so when she came back, I asked her, and uh, I tried to do it in my best German, and <laughs> she just laughed, and she says, oh, no, you, you have the whole house. You have die ganze Haus. Die ganze Haus. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, it was a quite... Uh, quaint little place, uh, you know, with modern appointments and conveniences. It was quite amazing. And just a walk away from the restaurant itself. And so they're out in the country and there's rolling hills and lots of forest and there's many, many walking paths so you can entertain yourself, you know. Sound of music. Yeah. (laughs) But I also went to the restaurant, uh, their flagship restaurant in Vienna, um, now run by the sun. And it's usually number 10, 12, you know, in the, among the 50 world's best restaurants. Is it? Wow. Really? <clears throat> and so that's also something that we, we like to do when we travel. We like to, I like to have our meals set up in advance. So How we, long? we know we're eating well yeah. and uh, we make that an opportunity to explore um, the fine cuisine of the country that we're in. How so, long do okay. you have to reserve reservations like that? I mean... Well, I don't know. We in our case, we we did this months ahead of time. Probably, months, probably about four to six months ahead of time. Wow! And what is your favorite Austrian meal or dish in Austria? <laughs> <laughs> well, the typical signature dishes are Wiener Schnitzel, yeah. <laughs> and Goulash Suppe. Yes. And so those are two of my favorites. Mom, you have to bring him. Goulash and schnitzel because it is so good. When she makes it, it's so good. You would like it. Too. Oh well, there's an art to that. I mean, they have they have articles and soliloquies about the perfect Wiener schnitzel <laughs> and and how they do it is very very you know it's a trade secret in yeah. some some cases. I just make it. I'm like <laughs> I make it how I always go. I know that's like if I ever filmed it, people would go, no, you can't do this or that. And I'm like, I don't care. I, that's just how we do it. And they, the kids Her love Austrian it. Austrian food is our favorite. Yeah, they Which love is, it. Do you like the goulash? It's a little it. spicy. I love, I love everything. <laughs> I don't know what Austrian dish I don't like. I don't think there's one. And oh. everybody I've dated, um, they miss her food. The Austrian When food. she breaks up with them, they'll, <laughs> they'll do this. <laughs> They all want her They're food. just stringing you along for meals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Is your mom cooking? I, I know we're not together there anymore, but can I go eat? I'm like, mm, sure. <laughs> I've never had it before. Just so long as she teaches you, right? Ex- well, yeah, and I'm not. I don't cook, so <laughs> that's well, the problem. That this has actually been a point of discussion lately because Chino and me, Marcella, they're like, well, we want to make it, but maybe not right now. But if we ever want to make it, like, how can we? have like a cookbook of yours or whatever and so I just recently decided to start making like a Instagram story cookbook and saving it so they can have it anytime yeah they want to make it but I can't be judged on it I said I don't <laughs> want anyone going oh my god that's not what you're supposed to do because I'm just doing it my only life. Austrians would know and maybe Dr. Jamal yeah, so he would go, this is so not right well, so don't watch it <laughs> in, in Austria there's a term called gemütlichkeit yes <laughs> and that's doesn't I don't think it translates directly into English, but basically it's kind of it kind of means hospitality. Mm-hmm. And that's the Austrians are very good at that. Mm-hmm. They make you feel welcome. Yes. Make you feel at home. Maybe that's why they miss your mom. Yeah, probably. <laughs> well and she, she is makes like them feel that. So yes. Good. She yeah. does. That's why she's all my best friends' moms. She's my ex boyfriend's mom. <laughs> she's <laughs> everybody. She likes she's like that. Open door in our home. Yep, always. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was very welcome. Um, now, I read that when you were studying in Vienna, you actually walked by the Lipisan horses every single day at the stables. You did. 
Yes, I don't know who told you that. <laughs> I have my ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. I lived in the city, and uh, in order to get to our classroom, the university, we I had to travel or walk by the uh, Lippis Honor um, stalls, I guess you call it. And, uh, you know, that's part of the um, royal palace, mm-hmm. the uh, w- winter palace. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I could s- hear them, smell them, you know. You, but you, I never went to a performance. I was just going to ask you, have you <laughs> ever seen the performance? Well, I have since I moved, so, since I, uh, yeah. you know, since I graduated and went back, we, we've been a couple times. What but. do you think of it? What do I think of it? I think it's it's really amazing. I mean, it's beautiful, very precise, and uh, it's ama- amazing what the horses can do. You never thought that horses could do things like that, like, right? Like walk on their hind legs and <laughs> yeah. whatnot. I feel exactly the same. My husband was so bored; he <laughs> hated it. He was he was like. This is not for me. Well, it's like <laughs> horse ballerinas. Yeah, he doesn't this, like yeah, he so. doesn't like ballet. Yeah. <laughs> well, it has, it's such a yeah, heritage, you know, mm-hmm. um, where the where the horses are from, where they came from, and you know how, how Spain figures into that, and um, it's just um, it's a tr- that's what I like. Uh, I like all these old traditions. Mm-hmm, me too. We like that too. I like it. I like it. We had to go on. That was like a field trip for us living in Austria, going to school there, you we went on field trips to Vienna to go to the opera, to Vienna to go see the horses. Like that was all uh-huh. part of growing up for the history sake of it. So going to the concentration camps, that is a field trip yeah. for school. So have you been? Um no, that was was on our it was a, on our tentative itinerary and my wife wanted to go to Mauthausen. Yeah. That's yeah. where you and were. we we wound up in that part of Vienna, but we didn't quite make that trip. We d- we opted for biking along the Danube <laughs> instead. <laughs> Probably more <laughs> lighthearted. Yeah, okay. No but yeah. I was obsessed with the concent. Like I could have stayed all day and learned everything. It's so crazy to be in that a real like the real place to walk through mm-hmm. the real. I mean. That is really where it happened, and then they do all, all this history stuff, and they have boxes of people's stuff, and you can read. It's just unbelievable. So next time you go, you need to do it. Well, I have been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. a okay. couple times, and the, the second time was uh, expressly for the purpose of taking our son. Okay. <laughs> because uh, these historical facts should never be forgotten no i know and it's up to me to pass it on to you know my son mm-hmm. and because when i growing up um you know my dad served in the army during world war ii and, oh, really? and he was trained training to be part of the invasion of japan and uh and so i grew up you know with with the history of of the war not too distant from me you know mm-hmm. right it was, you know, every weekend you could watch black and white newsreels on TV and, and saw these images, these horrible images. Mm-hmm. And um, they just kind of are indelible once you see them. Right. I like history. So. Yeah. I like, I like learning about it. I think it's very interesting. I think what I found so interesting when they went to the concentration camp is that my husband and Marcella, they said, this is nothing like what we learn in school yeah, in the United true. States. They yeah. don't tell us everything. You Not don't, at all. No. And they were just so intrigued. My husband mm-hmm. like came home and just started watching everything he could. Just well, and you can so watch the she. movies and you learn about it in school, but until you actually go. And then my mom's grandmother, my great-grandmother's um, husband, and all the history with our family, even with all that stuff, was interesting. She had the last key to the bomb shelter, or the key to the bomb shelter in her building. Yeah, my grandmother did. Wow. <laughs> she, and that was, it was always so interesting. We we were making fun of it because we said, so everyone had to be really nice friendly to you. you. <laughs> 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 in the <Whole> building. <laughs> yeah. What? Where did she grow up? What in Linz. In Linz, mm-hmm. okay. So and she, was Linz ever bombed? Or? Yeah, actually okay. her building got bombed one time. I mean, not, it didn't just like, I guess a little bit, but 
uh, my dad and my aunt were born already and they were in the shelter like she told me all about it i actually videotaped her last mm -hmm. time we went home before she passed away i made mm -hmm. sure i videotaped her she told us everything telling us so the one day we story. need to have you translate it yeah. so you can know mm -hmm. what it she's is saying. very interesting and we walked through the bomb shelter yeah we did well one of the things i noticed when i was a student there and this was quite a few years ago by the way <laughs> um we, we would have to heat our rooms with coal that, i was just going to oh, tell no, you that the bomb shelter was also her cellar where the coal came in like they had the windows and they would bring the coal and put it down and i grew up that way she had yeah. that's how she heated yeah. Yeah. the house she, we would <laughs> go down there and get the coal and she would have the coal stove but how so long does crazy. that last how many times you did do that i think once a day if i oh. remember correctly <laughs> yeah we had a little stove you know we were just uh living in a flat um just one room my roommate and i and we had a small coal burning stove in the corner and uh you know we get home from class and we'd start a fire and it would get roaring hot it would be toasty hot <laughs> until the fire went out then it would get cold again you know? <laughs> and so during that time you know you just have to get in bed and stay under the comforter you know? yeah. yeah i thought it was always so cool to go down there and have to shovel like the cold <laughs> shovel it out it was just so crazy but i was trying to get to another point which is uh, i noticed one thing i noticed is how many locks uh, are on the viennese doors in those days locks. you know everybody has a gate and mm -hmm. several locks and uh, security in those days was was more important right. very important yeah, yeah. so interesting the, and, you know interesting. in in the aftermath of the war yeah you know that that's uh yeah it's, it's very very interesting i love it i love it too i think the history in austria is amazing the architecture is amazing there's just nothing like that here uh, so. vienna is uh, really easy to get around in you know they have that historical district where you can cover the whole thing on mm -hmm. foot mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that's you know very unique and um, they managed to maintain uh, standards uh, for example st stephen's you know the largest uh, cathedral Catholic Church, yeah. and uh, nothing can be built taller than that spire you know it just has to remain the dominant figure on the skyline well, that's cool mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i know that i work literally one street over from <laughs> the st stephen's cathedral oh, for it if you say the street i might remember <laughs> yeah i was afraid you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> well in those days julius um, meinel was a popular uh -huh store i don't know if you remember it's a grocery store, yeah. yeah and, and <clears throat> now there's only one left in vienna really mm -hmm. oh wow that's crazy i haven't been home in so long you tell me See, i'm telling you you're <laughs> well, there I'm going again me. in the fall so you are just uh -oh. give me a list <laughs> <laughs> she might want you to bring some some stuff back <laughs> i can I, that's the thing though i can get so much now yeah that's if true you can have anything mailed you know well we one thing i brought back was the uh, pumpkin seed oil uh, yes everyone brings that to us but what we really now, one thing, schnapps. <laughs> we like uh, yeah, homemade schnapps. schnapps. And there's one in particular it's really hard to get. It's hollow schnapps. Mm. My friend loves it. Is and that from Allein? It's hollow. It's a, a, a flower, I think. Oh, okay. Um, and they make schnapps out of it. And <laughs> it's strong. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. So you travel a lot. You love traveling. I saw that you were at the Olympic Games in Salt Lake City wow. in 2002. And I've always wondered what it's like to be at the Olympic Games. Is that like, do you pick certain things that you like races to watch? What? How do you do that? Well, that's another story. Um, <laughs> and so we, we ski in, in Utah. We, we have a place where we go every year. My son was four when he learned how to ski. I'm getting caught up here in this uh -oh. cable. You're fine. Okay. That just really quick. Right. So you're married and you have one son, yes. correct? Yes, that's correct. So at the age of five, we started him skiing and we found a, a really cool place in Utah. And uh, so shortly after that, they uh, we found out that Utah was going to be um, in bidding for the Winter Olympics. And uh, so our, our friend who lives in Utah, he, he said, well, you know, you go on a website and you can volunteer to work the Olympics. And I, and I knew the downhill events would be at the ski resort that we were very familiar with. So I uh, put my name in and I was able to get some tickets early on. 
Um, but my wife and son, you know, didn't come with me. They, my son was in private school, and his mother didn't want to take him out of school for right. any any length of time. And so um, I, I had an interview, and I was not selected to be a worker at the Olympics. <laughs> but I had these tickets to the downhill events, the speed events, and I went, and uh, it was it was incredible. Now this was right after nine eleven. Okay. This is 2002, winter of 2002, mm-hmm. right after 9-11. And uh, we, I remember boarding the plane in Dallas right after the uh, opening ceremony started. I was watching it on TV. And we get into a holding pattern over Colorado because the uh, ceremonies had gone on longer than expected. Okay, And somebody behind me said, hey, uh, did you guys see that F-16 out our left no. side of the plane no. uh-uh. so we we had a, a fighter escort well, and, that and, has and the, to pr- be crazy. the purpose of the escort was to not to make sure we got there safely but to make sure that they shot us down in case there was a terrorist attack okay oh my that goodness. had to be crazy were you scared well it's kind of chilling i i didn't i wasn't too worried about being shot down but i <laughs> It, it's just a very kind of a chilling thing yeah, to, right. to realize that one day, you know, everything is kind of innocent and, 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 and safe. And then the next day you're under suspicion, you know, everything is now has an element of danger to right. it. You know? And so we got into Salt Lake City and everybody, all the planes were coming in at once and the uh, the the baggage carousels, you know, were were full. The that era, the baggage area is full of people, uh, all of whom were speaking languages other than English. <laughs> oh yeah, so, world, that's cool. Um, but uh, that that was really cool, and um, so I was able to attend the the men's downhill, and I had tickets, and I got on the bus, and we had to go through security, just like you would get on an airplane. You get on the bus, and you bust up there. Uh, there was a delay ahead of us getting to the ski resort, and uh, that delay had to be resolved by Mitt Romney, who was what? who was the director of the Olympic oh, wow. Committee at the time. So he was calling all the shots there, and he had to come out and intervene. It was some kind of a security matter. So we got there just right after the downhill started, and after, after the men's downhill finished, I went back down took the bus back down into the the valley um took my car drove it to another parking lot that was owned by the ski resort got a pass to park there went through security went back up on another bus and i was actually able to ski the the downhill i i was i watched the women's downhill actually from the course so i was able to get on to the course i was able to get uh, right up to the fence dang that's cool wow so that you know you feel you, really amazing you couldn't go from one side to the other they had their separate security yeah. systems and i remember having lunch and i was i'm by myself mind you okay so i'm on my i'm entertaining myself and <laughs> yeah. i sit down in the in the uh restaurant and to, for lunch and all of a sudden these forest service people come in and sit down with me and they've all got guns. Okay. They're all (laughs) armed. I've never seen a forest service employee armed before, but because part of the resort is in forest service land, public land, they're, they're chartered to protect people. And they were actual snipers in the trees during those events. Dang. Snipers in the trees. Mm -hmm. Wow. I didn't know they did no, that. I didn't that's either. crazy. Well, that's for the, that's because of yes. 9/11. Yeah. Do the, they still do that? Oh, that no. and uh, Atlanta in '96 was the last Olympics that was here, and that was when they was bombed. Right. So they were, you know, not only 9/11, but everything was just heightened. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm. So interesting. That's crazy. Little factoid you I, didn't know. I, no, I, no, I love <laughs> knowing that. that. That's amazing. <laughs> now, um, I also know that you like to go to Italy and France. And what happened to you when you went to France last? Tell us. Oh, my, oh, that was the uh, aborted trip. We went uh, to Chamonix, okay, flew into Paris. We spent a few days in Paris. 
And then we decided to go down to uh, Italy and we flew to Milan. We rented a car and drove to Chamonix. And uh, we, we had a beautiful hotel room uh, over, you know, looking up at Mont Blanc. And uh, about the third day, the, the weather broke. It was sunny and we decided to go up to the top of Mont Blanc. We took the cable car and it's a two, two stage cable car. And uh, on the way back down, we got off at the uh, mid-mountain level, and it was a beautiful day, and we just decided we're going to walk down. Okay, We're going to take one of the hiking paths. And just below the tree line, it, the, the path went into a shaded area, and it was full of rocks, very smooth rocks. Mm-hmm. And I tried to gently place my foot on one of these rocks, to get my footing and it slipped off and I, I broke my ankle. No, in, on the mountain. On the mountain, yeah. In France. Okay, so what, what do we do? Well, I try to get up a couple times. I can't, I can't stand. I mean, I can stand, but I can't walk because there's nothing. Oh. <laughs> Drums in here. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing supporting my ankle. So how do we get down? Well, I tried to scoot down. But, no. You know, that's not gonna work. Uh, we tried the phone. We couldn't get to the hotel. We didn't learn how to. We didn't learn any emergency numbers. This is an exercise in what not to do. Okay, <laughs> when you travel, always know. <laughs> Be prepared because yeah. you never know. And uh, finally, a, a very nice uh, couple came along, and uh, about thirty minutes after this, and, and they were able to call for help. And uh, thirty minutes later, we I had a private helicopter ride off the mountain. Well, that's the best case scenario there in that Private situation. helicopter to a hospital and <laughs> surgery in France while you go to Exactly. I got to experience the French healthcare system <laughs> firsthand, and uh, it's, it's really quite good. Mm-hmm. And uh, the meals were, the hospital food was quite good. <laughs> <laughs> wow. When was this? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think it's uh, 2016. Okay. A few mm-hmm. years ago. Wow. And and so um, that cut our vacation short. It was about, it was about halfway in on day five, and uh, what a bummer! So my my wife drove us back to Milan, and we got you know, got a, the last flight out of Milan to Paris, and from there we came home. Uh, there there are some funny stories involved with that too, but I don't want to. <laughs> I don't monopolize the conversation. So. Uh, you you never monopolize the conversation. We have to. Um, just want to know one more thing. You run. You you're an avid runner and biker, correct? So has that like hurt well, you now? With it 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 is my you know it's all caught up to me now. Um, you know I just don't uh, run as much as I used to, but I do bike more. Yeah. And try to try to stay fit, and uh, you know it's just part of who I am. You know, you, once you develop those habits, you don't yeah, give, give them up. No. Yeah. Never. That's good. Now, is your son, um, he is in New York, correct? Is he still there? Yeah, yeah. He's yeah. in uh, living now in Brooklyn. He was living in Manhattan, and then they he got married. and He did get married. Oh, and, and last time I talked to you, he was engaged. So Yeah, he, he married a beautiful young lady, and, and they, they had been dating for many, many years mm-hmm. through college mm-hmm. and, and through five, four, four or five years of living in D.C., and then... Uh, his fiance then wanted to get her MBA at Columbia, so they moved to New York. Oh wow! I love New York. Oh, I do too. Yeah, yes, yeah. wonderful. Now, Especially if you're young or you're rich. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It was very <laughs> like <expensive>. LA. <laughs> um, now we have to get to something we're going to start doing, and that is the question of today. Oh yeah. And let me say, I have a question. Oh, I have a question. <laughs> And the question this week is, we want to know what has happened to Valentine's Day. I want to know your opinion because Valentine's Day at one point was where usually the husband gave the wife something. It was never a a men's holiday. And it was like the husband would give the wife chocolate, flowers, whatever. Well, what I see now, Valentine's Day has become... Everybody has to give everybody something. I mean, the teachers, the kids at school, all the students. And it's becoming bigger and bigger. Just the card or chocolate is no longer enough. It has to be this 
extravagant, over the top. Well, and there's Galentine's Day now, which uh-huh. is new, which I think is a big thing from social media, which is girlfriends getting together. They're gals. Single. Sing- yeah. No, not necessarily. Oh, no. Nope, not single. Oh, you don't just have to be single. Now it's you have to tell your girlfriends how much you love them and have a Galentine's Day and a Galentine's Day dinner. And you see, it's out of control. (laughs) (laughs) This is crazy. I started being so stressed. I'm like, everywhere I look, everybody has these big presents and (laughs) gifts and boyfriends are giving their girlfriends in high school. They have like all this big deal, like one in particular, Jolie school I saw. He actually parked his car in the parking lot, had the trunk open had balloons, had Happy Valentine's Day, a, a whole entire display in the trunk. I'm like, oh They're doing gosh. it for Instagram. My, yeah. uh, my first question would be, what would you do? Uh, well, I think it's all for now social media. I'm sure. You yeah. know, so you outdo each other and you give this and parents give adult children and then and, and children to give their parents. What do you think about that? What did you do for Valentine's Day? I'm just sitting here amazed that... <laughs> That's what Valentine's Day has become right. because, you know, and, and we're still very traditional. So we don't we don't go overboard on Valentine's right. Day. Yeah. As my wife says, it's for amateurs. <laughs> oh, yeah. I like that, yeah. though. How long have you been married? Uh, 40 years. Wow. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. Congratulations. That so is you so just amazing. do the like chocolate and flowers? Or Usually dinner? some kind of chocolate. Actually, oftentimes I'll go get a soccer tort. You oh, do. It's yeah. an Austrian, the, yeah. the yeah. famous Austrian cake. How cool. Yeah. So. Well, and we want to know uh, to our listeners, too. Um, they We want them to kind of get yes. involved in our questions of the day since we're starting that today um, or this show mm-hmm. and tell us what you think and to how you like Valentine's Day to be if you like the new thing that's happening. Uh, crazy Valentine's Day stories or horror stories. And... Um, I was going to say I lost my train of thought, but I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And we want to just know everybody's opinion on all that stuff. It's still one of my favorite people watching days. I didn't get to DJ this year, but I did last year and I just have such a good time watching people. Why? Well, it's uh, because everyone's in a good mood. Oh, they are? That's good. Well, sometimes I feel like there's too much pressure, too. I feel like uh, girls can get disappointed if the guy doesn't do enough like their friends. Or everyone's trying to outdo each other, so then people get their feelings hurt, and then there might be too much stress. And then we always say when you go to dinner on Valentine's Day, it actually sucks because they're just rushing you. Okay, next, next, next. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't really get to enjoy it. So yeah, and used to. Tired. I haven't seen it too much the last couple of years, but they used to have like places would just do a Valentine's menu. Yeah, so like yeah. you couldn't. You could go to your favorite restaurant, but they weren't serving the same food, and it was all more expensive. Yeah. Yeah, so we want to know what everybody thinks of the new Valentine's Day, Galentine's Day, Mm. Instagram. Extravaganza. Extravaganza. Out of control. (laughs) I mean, really. I was like, what the heck? There is one more thing. Uh, Leanne Locken from the Dallas Housewives. Housewives. Her, she's engaged. Her fiance, I think he put, I want to say 97 balloons in his truck or something. And he has it filmed how he's bringing it home. And he like taped them all onto the ground so that the whole entire wall was full of heart balloons. And then it said, happy Valentine's. No, I said, I love you. And then he had these roses. It was a, I mean, it was unbelievable. The production that he went through, Mm -hmm. he got up at four in the morning to set it all up by the time she was up. I I think I was sleeping. (laughs) I would rather have that for like my birthday. Right. Or like, I don't know, like the over, like maybe one, like you go over the top for my 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 special day like my <laughs> birthday maybe not like valentine's day i don't need all that yeah my opinion yeah how about little things every yeah. day yeah. instead of one big uh, thing uh, like uh, yeah. yeah that's what we like to say there you go yeah little things every, every day. day yeah I and like it doesn't have to be things but like how they treat yes. you and just kind of the daily thing because sometimes we we do like your wife says it's just kind of hmm why are you going over the top it's just one of those days you better not forget, though. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> that that you true. need to remind yourself, yes. <laughs> and on that note, we're yeah. going to end this the show, show, and yes. I want you to give your social media information so people can find you. Like, um, what what's your website's name, and what's your name uh, for your company for the um, practice? Okay, so um, I have invented something, uh, a type of lens, and it's a very 
sophisticated and we use a couple of devices that have, have lasers in them to, Just me- give us to measure the, the eye. So we call it laserfitlens.com, www.laserfitlens.com. And your name is Dr. Greg Tumalis. Is that a website too? Is, that's a different uh, one, no, right? No, I, I don't think I have my own website anymore. No, oh, no. We, we have the, the laserfitlens.com, and we started that, I don't know, 2013, 14. And that's... Uh, that's the main website to get in touch I have with my, you? I have my own Facebook account, of course. I have to. But, you know. right. <laughs> okay, everyone, go follow Dr. Jamalis, and, and stay tuned for the next show. show that we're going to talk all about eye health care and LASIK surgery and all kinds of good things. Stay tuned, everyone.